Bring God a sacrifice that's gonna cost you something. God's not impressed when we bring him pornography. We're not supposed to be watching it anyways, right? We bring it to the altar and go, God, I'm giving you this. He goes, giving it to me? Why are you bringing me sin? I'm not trying to, I, we don't sacrifice sin on the altar. We sacrifice something that, that cost us something, something that we care about and love. Hello, this is David Diga Hernandez, and you are watching ETV interviews here on the Encounter TV Network. My guest today, Isaiah Saldivar. A former atheist, Isaiah Saldivar's life was forever changed on January 12, 2011, at a church service in Modesto, California. It was then and there that Isaiah heard the audible voice of God say, I am going to use you to preach the gospel to every nation. Isaiah was instantly transformed by God and those around him were astonished to see such a dramatic change in Isaiah. Isaiah immediately began to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit by throwing out all of the unclean things in his life. Sometime later, Isaiah began to host home prayer meetings. Those prayer meetings rapidly grew into an awakening at which many are still being delivered, healed, and saved. Today, Isaiah travels the world preaching the gospel to the lost and challenging believers to break free from spiritual complacency and worldly compromise. My friend. How you doing? Thank you for being Excited here. Excited to be here. I have been looking forward to this moment for quite some time. I've known about your ministry for several years now, and always in the back of my mind, I was telling myself, at some point, yeah. I have to have Evangelist Isaiah, or Pastor Isaiah, onto the program. And so I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited. What's God been doing in your life recently, my friend? So yeah, recently I've been traveling uh, pretty much full time. You know, right now, summertime, conferences, revivals been going on. So I've been doing that, um, traveling almost every weekend. And then also I pastor, I'm a senior pastor of a church in Manteca, California called The Awakening 209. So I do that. I have three little girls, five, three, and 10 months old, and I've been married for seven years. So. I stay pretty busy. Oh, Things have been I, I, awesome. I imagine so. You have both the title and the giftings of an evangelist and a pastor. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that makes you a very unique voice today. Now, someone looking at your ministry today, they see the anointing, they see the preaching, they see the power of God, but it didn't start like that for you. No, not at all. You have one of the most tremendous testimonies, and I think that the people need to hear it. Yeah, so I was telling someone on the way over here, sometimes when you tell your testimony, even especially mine, it sounds so outlandish and so wild, but I think we've so watered down what God can do, and we've kind of removed the realm of possibility that God could take an atheist and turn them into a preacher, or we say a prostitute and turn her into a prophet, or you know, a drug addict and turn him into a pastor. But for me, I had such a radical encounter in 2011. I was a full-blown atheist. I'd been raised in church. I stopped going at 16. At 19 years old, I had not gone to church for uh, almost four years at the time. I had no plans to go to church. I graduated high school at 16. I graduated college at 19. I just said, I want nothing to do with God. I was with a girl for four years, I was about to marry, and my little sister kept bugging me, go to church, go to church. So I remember one night I told my girlfriend, look, we're just gonna go one time, and we're gonna get her to stop bugging us, and we're gonna just go and see what happens. And I remember David walking through the doors of that church, January 12, 2011, saying, this will be the last time I ever come to church. And it was that night, we all, you know, we know the story that God only needs one night. And I remember um, the pastor got him preaching, and really it wasn't even a relevant message to where I was at, but he, I remember him preaching, and I felt something pulling on my shirt. It wasn't just like, oh, I felt like I should go to the altar. I mean, I literally felt something pulling, physically, physically pulling, like it was pulling on me. And I couldn't explain it. I just knew I had to get to the altar. And I'll never forget running to that altar and saying, God, I don't effing believe in you. I mean, I'm literally cussing at the altar. I have no verbiage to what you're supposed to say. One thing I did know is I said, I'm not going to pray the sinner's prayer. I'd been raised up in religion and you just pray a prayer and you're saved. And I can remember parting and praying a prayer and nothing happening. I can remember going out, sleeping around and just praying this prayer. And so I said, I'm not praying the prayer, but I remember saying, God, if you're real, I'll give you everything. I'll move out of state. I'll break up with the girl I was with for four years. I'll leave my job. I was getting hired at the time as a police officer, my dream from a childhood. I said, God, I'll do anything if you're real. And in that moment, the audible voice of God said, Isaiah. And you know that when God says your name, there's seven billion people in the world. And for God to know you by name, here I am, an atheist, cussing at the altar. And the audible voice of God says, Isaiah, I have a plan for your life. And I'll never forget, God said, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. I think we're living in the day where God is saying, I'm tired of your leftovers. I'm tired of halfway in, halfway out. We come to church 1.5% of our week, we end up in church. And we give God this 30-minute praise and 30-minute worship. And we live all week long 
void of the power of the Holy Spirit, void of a prayer life, void of a supernatural life. And so I remember that moment, God saying, I don't want 99.9. I either want all of you or none of you. And my personality is I'm a very radical guy. When I get into things, I go all out. So I remember at that altar, first time in 10 years, I'm crying. And what was crazy was dirt started coming out of my eyes. And mind you, I'm an atheist two minutes ago. I'm sitting here crying for the first time in 10 years. I was so arrogant and prideful and depressed and bitter and hard-hearted. I'm crying at the altar. Dirt's coming out of my eyes. I have no clue. I'm not talking about spiritual and, you know, people may believe this or not, but it was actual physical dirt. And I didn't know that Saul had dirt come out of his eyes and had his encounter. As this is happening, I'm getting visions. I'm seeing lights. I'm in like this trance. I don't know vision or what it was. The pastor gets on stage, there's 800 kids at the altar, and the pastor says, there's a young man right now, and God's removing the dirty scales off your eyes. God's taken away, and I had been addicted to pornography. I mean, I was just so jaded by the world. Dirt's coming out of my eyes, I'm crying, I'm, I'm there at the altar. You know, it's like when you get lost in the spirit, an hour goes by, and it's like, feels like it's a minute. So I thought I was at the altar for a minute. I mean, I genuinely, I'm speaking in tongues, so I remember speaking in tongues. I didn't ask for it. No one laid hands on me. My girlfriend's next to me who's never been to church. And I'm covering my mouth because I don't want her to hear me speaking in tongues. And I'm speaking in this unknown language. I'd never really heard of tongues before. Maybe when I was like five, I heard my parents praying in it. But I had no point of reference. I didn't know what was going on. I'm uncontrollably speaking in tongues. I'm crying. I'm feeling something surging over my body. I'm getting visions of all these end times, me preaching on stages, God speaking to me, saying, I'm going to use you. I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to anoint you as a prophet. You're going to travel. You're going to preach. And I'm going, I'm just overwhelmed. So service gets over. Everybody comes to me going, are you okay? I thought it had been like a minute. It had been over an hour. I'm at that altar crying. I didn't recognize anything. I said, I need to get home. I mean, everything's different. You talk about being born again. I was born again that night. I get home. I stayed up all night. I'll never forget this. I stayed up all night. I was getting visions, download. I was telling, kept my family up all night speaking and telling them what God was doing. The next day I get in my car, I had my little tricked out ride. I thought I was all cool. I was driving to college and I'll never forget David pulling over on the side of the road on my way to college. And I feel it even now, just crying my eyes out on the side of the freeway. I'm, I'm out on the side of the road, get out of my car because I'm crying uncontrollably. And I'm sitting on the freeway looking at the sky going, I've never seen the sky before. I've never seen the trees. I mean, everything was new. I mean, born again. I get to college, I'm seeing demons. Ever. I mean, mind you, I'm an atheist 12 hours ago. So this is how radical it was. I'm seeing demons. I'm seeing angels. I'm starting to see the spirit realm. God had literally opened up my eyes to the spirit realm full on. I mean, I couldn't avoid it or hide it. I'm sitting in class. I'm, I'm just kind of losing it at this point. I'm hearing voices of the guy next to me. So I'm going, are you, I'm trying to talk to him. He's going, what are you talking about? I'm getting download from him when he was a kid. I mean, God was, I didn't know the word of knowledge. So I just thought, oh, I'm a, I'm a psychic now. You know what I mean? And so I'm having this encounter. My professor, I told my professor, I have to go, which I was a straight A student. I never missed a day of college. I was an undercover nerd, the whole thing. And I told my professor, I have to go. Something's happening to me. Something's, something's happening to me. And I remember getting home, crying to my parents. I don't know what's going on with me. I don't know what to do. I'm hearing voices. I'm, I couldn't even leave the house. I mean, literally they wouldn't take me out of the house because I'm trying to prophesy over everyone. I didn't know. So long story short, they called my uncle Nino. He was in New York, the only one in our family that was in the ministry. He's been in ministry over 30 years. They said, you need to get home. He said, I can't get home. I'm in New York doing a conference. They said, no, you need to get home. Something happened to Isaiah. Mind you, I deleted 45,000 songs. This is 10 years ago when you actually had to buy music. 45,000 songs off my iTunes. I got rid of all my Xbox games, all my video games, broke up with my girlfriend I was with for four years. I mean, I just threw everything out. I was breaking TVs. My parents are going, what are you doing? I'm breaking movies. My parents move it. I mean, I'm getting rid of everything everything because I didn't want what was happening to me to stop. I didn't want what God was doing in my life to stop. So I knew just automatically, no preacher told me, I knew I have to get rid of everything ungodly in my life. And, and at the time I was saying the F word every other word before I got saved. I was watching pornography. I was drinking every day, partying. So I have this radical encounter. My uncle gets home. I hadn't slept for three days. I didn't eat for two weeks. I lost 30 something pounds. And my uncle got home and said, what, what is happening to you? I left Saul and I came home to Paul. He said, what, what's God saying? So for 14 hours, David, straight, I'm talking about what God is doing, what God is saying, revival, the fivefold anointing, the ministering angels I'm seeing, demonic powers being broken. I'm just, and my uncle knows, I don't know where, I didn't read about this. You know, I never knew what revival was and God's downloading and downloading me. So he said, okay, after 14 hours, straight, 14 hours, you think I'm talking fast now? I mean, I was, you couldn't understand me at that time. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. The Lord said to pray for revival. 
He said, who told you about that? I said, what? He said, revival. I said, God told me. He said, okay, so what do we, I said, we're just going to pray. So what I began to do was start calling all my party friends, because at that time I was throwing these big parties. So I started calling all my party friends saying, you, they're calling me, what's going on? I said, you need to come to my house. I want to tell you what's been happening with me. So I'm only safe for three days. I'm in my living room and there's 25 people in my house and they're just old party friends, family members, and I just start preaching. I mean, I'm talking about God's coming back. You know, when you first get saved, you think the world's ending tomorrow. So I said, you know, we're an end time generation and I'm up there preaching. It was so radical and wild. My uncle would get up after me and translate. Okay, here's what the scripture, here's what he's saying because I was just all over the place. So that night, I'll never forget, a lady came in, was demon-possessed, and she started manifesting. And so it was like game on. You know, I'm radically saved. I don't really know what I'm doing, but started casting demons out of her. And I like to say it this way. December 31st, I was literally at a beer pong tournament for New Year's, and January 15th, I'm casting out demons. So such a radical transformation. And you're talking guys that were at my house that I was partying with 10 hours a day are crying, sobbing for eight hours in prayer. I mean, I'm talking about radical, not just this tickle me Elmo, little nice Jesus where you just pray a prayer and he just comes in your heart. I'm talking about God just wrecking our lives. I'm talking about my family, my parents getting rocked, my sisters getting rocked, my brother. I mean, I could go on story to story, but really a re real organic revival. So then the next week, 50 people, 70 people, 90 people, 100 people. Within three months, we had 500 people coming to my living room. Um, we put about 200 inside and about 300 outside. But I mean, it was the book of Acts, no promotion, no Facebook no Instagram, no flyers, just the hand of God moving. And I even share this and I go, this sounds so wild, but I, about a month ago I went back to my journal and I started reading the stories and reminding myself of the faithfulness of God. I think it's easy as ministers, we get so caught up in professional ministry and going through the motions. And, and then I go back as David said, I remind myself of your faithfulness, that God, you're good and you're powerful. And I build, I build monuments in remembrance of what you've delivered me and saved me from. So yeah, nine years later, we're still going on. We meet every Tuesday night, God's moving. We're seeing miracles, signs, wonders. It's been, it's been wild. It's been a wild journey. It's been awesome. You've said so many powerful <laughs> things, my friend. Now, one of the things you mentioned that stood out to me was the fact that before you had this divine, genuine encounter, yeah. that you had on multiple occasions said the sinner's prayer before. Yeah, yeah. You know that's part of the culture. Oh yeah, totally. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that we've created a culture of convenience and ease. So we tell people, I tell people all the time, if the rich young ruler was in the American church, he'd be on board and on leadership of the church because we tell him, as long as you have money, you just pray a prayer. But Jesus talked him out of salvation. Preach that. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm here tonight to talk you out of salvation. I want to tell you why you're not ready to follow Jesus. These are not messages we hear, yet Jesus himself tells a rich and ruler, you're not ready to follow me. It's more than just praying a prayer, inviting me to come into your heart and living like the devil and then one day going to heaven. Jesus goes, I didn't just die for you, I died as you. The one that knew no sin didn't just die for sin, but the Bible says he actually became sin and became, became you know, the curse and we became the righteousness of God. So um, this whole thing that we've done as evangelists, I think we've just done it because it's easy. Just pray a prayer and we're giving people a false sense of salvation. And I honestly believe there are countless of multitudes of Christians in the church that are going to die and stand before God on judgment day. And God's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you. That's the epidemic. I was preaching at church last night. I said, the reality is there's many of you in this room going to hell. According to the Bible, you're going to hell. Although you tithe, although you pray for the sick, although you drive out devils, you don't have an intimate connection with the Holy Spirit or with Jesus. And Jesus is not looking for you to pray a prayer. He's looking for your entire life. He doesn't just want to change you. He wants to kill you. So I think that's been very damaging in our generation to tell people you just have to pray a prayer. And we always, what do we use? Revelation 3. What do we say? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And what do we do as preachers? God's knocking on the door of your heart. That verse has nothing to do with your heart. What it was was Jesus outside the church. We got so busy with our programs and our parties and our picnics and our outreaches, we don't care no longer about the presence. And what it was was, it was he was outside the church. And he said, behold, I stand outside the door of the church and knock. And if any of you would be so, stop being so busy with all your churchianity and religiosity and all your going through the motions, and you'd actually hear my voice, not the voice of a celebrity preacher wearing leather pants on stage, not the voice of some nice worship leader, singing us into our emotionalism but if you'd hear my voice of the Holy Spirit and you'd open up the door I would come back and I believe we are in the hour where Jesus is getting ready to come back to the American church and bring awakening bring revival there's going to be deliverances like never before healings like never before I mean we're living in the greatest moments of human history right now how can the believer prepare for that 
I think by getting your life right, getting your life clean, if you have idols in your life, if there are things, whether it be Netflix, whether it be Instagram, whether it be Hulu's, we find in Luke 14, the great wedding banquet, the great, great feast that the master prepared. If you look at all the reasons why they didn't accept his invitation, it was never the bad things. I think we think it's the bad things that stop me from revival. It's the drugs, it's the pornography, it's the fornication, it's the idolatry. It was not bad things, it was good things. He said, I just bought an oxen I wanna try out. I just bought property I need to assess. I just got married. So what's preventing the American church from revival is not sin, it's good things in our life that are preventing us from the God things. The more of God, I like to call it. So I challenge people all the time, don't get rid of the bad things, get rid of the good things. Bring God a sacrifice that's gonna cost you something. God's not impressed when we bring in pornography. We're not supposed to be watching it anyways, right? We bring it to the altar and go, God, I'm giving you this. He goes, giving it to me? Why are you bringing me sin? I'm not trying to, I, we don't sacrifice sin on the altar. We sacrifice something that that cost us something, something that we care about and love. For me, it was a girl I was with for four years. For me, it was a job in law enforcement making $100,000 a year at 20 years old. For me, it was my music that I worship. For me, it was my video games. I would challenge the American church and the believer, ask God to search out the good things in your life that he wants to get rid of so he could bring revival. That's the things I'm seeing stop the American church from what God wants to do. And a lot of these things are just time wasters. Absolutely. Time that could be spent in intimacy and in prayer with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yes. Why is the church so distracted? I think it's, uh, we've trained the church that Christianity is based on what you do for 45 minutes on Sunday rather than the 167 hours outside the church. So we're training people what to do in the church, but not training people what to do outside the church. God's more concerned with what we do on Tuesday. I tell people all the time, is there, we pray at church and I love worship. I love extravagant praise. I'm a loud preacher. I mean, I love the shouting and the dancing and the excitement, but I'm going, is there a praise at home? Is there a worship at home? The same prayer life you have at church, you have that at home, is your man cave or prayer room. I mean, are we are we living this thing out outside the church? The days of leaving Jesus at the church are over. God wants to go home with us. The fire of God was never meant to be contained in the four walls of a church. And so we're trying to get people, 1.5% of our week is spent in church, statistically. And we think God is so impressed by the fact we give him 1% of our life. We're like, God, I'm showing up. I'm. You should be proud of me. And God's going, I don't want a part of you. I want all of you. I don't want your leftovers. I don't I want the rest of you. I want the best of you. And so many of us come to give God our little praise, our little worship, our 10%. And God goes, I want all of you. I want your week. I want Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I have people all the time say, is that all you talk about is God? And I'm going, what else is there to live for? I mean, there's nothing else to live for. And the, the vocabulary of the American church, we don't hear that in the church. We don't hear spiritual encounters. We don't hear people saying, man, I went into prayer at 10 a.m. yesterday and I woke up, it was 5 p.m. I was lost in the spirit. I was translated to another dimension. I mean, you talk about true pleasure. We binge watch TV shows, but I'm going, when are we going to binge pray? When are we going to fast? When are we going to cry out to God? When is God going to become our pleasure? When is God going to become our entertainment? When are we going to get so lost in the spirit where we get a holy addiction, where we're in prayer in the secret place where God says, I want to meet you. So I think it starts with taking God and saying, I'm not going to leave you at church. I'm going to actually bring you home with me and I'm going to encounter you every single day. It's a lifestyle. My friend sitting here listening to you, I know we talked about how the Lord uses you as a pastor, mm -hmm. as, a, as an evangelist. I'm hearing a prophet. Come on. Church, I want you to hear this. This is what a prophetic voice sounds like. Confrontational, radical, challenging Come on. truth. I hear so many claim to be prophets, Isaiah, and all they want to tell the people is how blessed they're going to be That's if they right. give to them. Yeah. But what I'm hearing you say, the church needs to hear. And I, can I say this? I'm, I'm, so, I'm so blessed to know that God has raised a voice like you in our generation. Amen. And I, I, I do want to let you know publicly so. I honor that anointing on your Amen. life, my friend. Now, talk to the person listening. Yes. Who's hearing you talk and who's being challenged. Yeah. And there's something stirring in them. Yeah. Look right at that camera and yes. talk to them. I want to say, man, you could have revival in your living room. You don't have to wait to get a stage, to get an opportunity, to get an invite. God wants to use you right now. If God could take an atheist at an altar that said, God, I don't know you. I don't care about you. I'm uninterested. And God says, Isaiah, I'm going to take you from the back of the line. I'm going to put you in the front of the line. I mean, I was 10 months saved on stage with Reinhard Bonnke and God TV going, how did I get here? It was only the hand of God. And I want to prophesy over every person watching that God's hand is on you, that you may have fallen, but the Bible 
Bible says, although a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. And it's time for some of you to rise up out of complacency. It's time to break out of the casualness. It's time to get a new shout, a new praise, a new fire. I wanna challenge you watching even now, shut down the Instagram for a week. I promise you it will be there when, you're back, when you get back. If you'll give God your, your time and your energy and your effort and you'll shut down all the other voices that have been distracting you, as Luke 14 calls it, the good things in our life, I would challenge you to evaluate your life and say, God, are there areas of my life that are preventing me from walking out this thing? I'm telling you, if God could use me, I know God could use you. Can I just pray over the people? Father, we ask right now that you would send power in the name of Jesus. God, we are praying that there would be supernatural encounters. God, I'm praying in every living room, in every television, every computer, that you would open up Jacob's ladder, that angels would ascend and descend. God, we are praying the same spirit that raised Christ is awakening them even now. God, that your presence and your power is not bound by time. Lord, I pray you would open up a Kairos moment that God, that same audible voice I heard January 12, 2011, that right now, God, through this show, you are speaking to your people. God, we say, awaken the prophets, Lord. We say, awaken God, the evangelistic anointing, Lord. We pray, God, right now, let your church rise up. God, we know that you're not coming back for a prostitute. You're coming back for a bride. So, Father, we are asking, God, wash us of our idols. I just want you to pray this prayer that David prayed. David said, search my heart, O God, and find anything in my life that offends you. Friend, it is possible that you have grieved the Holy Spirit, that you have actually offended the very Spirit of God that wants to wash you and cleanse you. So I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to repeat, say, God, I want you to wash me. I want you to search my heart. And Lord, put your finger on anything in my life that is getting in the way of the assignment and the call that you have on my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. And so Lord, amen. we pray. Yes, Lord. In the name yes, God, of Jesus. Your anointing. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit would overwhelm that one receiving this prayer now. Holy Spirit, help us to love Jesus like you love Jesus. Cause him to become clear. Cause us to see the master. And Father, I pray that your fire would stir that one to holiness. Give us grace. Give us your power. We lay ourselves down. We surrender all. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Wow. My friend, there is such an anointing on you. Amen. Thank and you. And I, I am so grateful that you came down today. Um, please tell us, how do we get a hold of you, your ministry? Is there a website? I'm sure. Yes, yeah, so we you can, can follow me on Instagram at Isaiah Saldivar. You can go to www.isaiahsaldivar.com. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Isaiah Saldivar. And the church is called The Awakening 209. So, so if someone's in the Northern California yeah. area, come down Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Well, God is on the move. Well, I will say this. I, I want to say to those of you watching, let's, let's rally behind this man of God. Pray for this man of God. Support this man of God. Some of you pastors watching, you, you need to get him into your church. Come on. You need to get this prophetic voice into your conferences and into your events. This is a voice of God in the earth today. I am totally convinced of that. Amen. My friend, thank you, thank so, you much so much for, for coming me. on. Had a great time. I appreciate you. Amen. And that is it for this edition of ETV Interviews here on the Encounter TV Network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.